2021 budget, interrogating and recalibrating priorities. Parliament passed a budget, a 45.5 trillion budget for 2020 and 2021. And our budget strategy is anchored on the third National Development Plan or NDP3. The budget theme remains industrialization for job creation and shared priority with a goal of increasing household incomes and improving the quality of life of Ugandans. We are going to hear from a set of distinguished budget experts. And with us on the line, we have Ms. Sophie Nampeo, the budget policy specialist from Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group. You're welcome, Sophie. We have uh, Ms. You. Juliet nakato Joy. Yeah, the head of programs, Forum for Women in Democracy. You're welcome, Juliet. Um, Sarah. And then we have, yes, please. Uh, just to say that Juliet had um, an emergency. So Rebecca Twine is actually sitting in for her. And um, she's a program manager in charge, in charge of women's economic justice. Okay. Rebecca Twine, you're welcome to, to this dialogue. And we have Madam Margaret Kakande, the Head of Budget Monitoring and Accountability from the Ministry of Finance. You're welcome, our distinguished panelists. Are we able to do a video now? There? For some reason... <laughs> For some reason today it's refusing, but I'm just um, working on it. Uh, in the meantime, we can continue speaking, but I'm on it. Okay, all right. But uh, to kick, up, kick us off, I wish to invite our host, Madame Lea, to take us through the key objectives of this, of this Zoom meeting and you set the agenda. All right, um, thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you everybody else um, for joining us. Forgive me for the little glitch, for some reason, all my Zoom knowledge has gone out of the window in spite this not being the first meeting I'm hosting. Nonetheless, we can hear each other and I'll try to figure out what the problem is and we'll have video uh, um, when that issue is fixed. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome you to this really important conversation that we are co-convening with the Frederick Ebert Stiftung. And I'm going to call on my colleague, uh, Maria Alessi, to actually give opening remarks. Um, thank you. And I'm looking forward to the great conversation that we are going to have today. Uh, thank you very much, Lea. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for making time to be part of this important conversation. Sarah and Leah have emphasized that enough. So I'll just like to say a few things that as a social justice organization, sorry, I've not introduced myself. My name is Maria Alessi. I'm a program manager at the Frederick Ebert Foundation, and we're happy to co-convene this event with Akina Mama, just to focus a little bit on how the budget um, is going to look like ahead of the, the reading tomorrow, but what that means for us in the future also, especially because we're living in a time that is quite unique. Um, I don't think there's any time that citizens have listened to the government more than they have in this season. So I'm sure we'll have more people very attentive to the budget and wanting to hear what government is planning, especially because of the current health and economic challenges that we are facing as a country. There's an old saying that says that uh, put your money where your mouth is, right? So um, I'm hoping that we're hoping that as government reads out the budget tomorrow, as we hear more about what, how government is planning to raise money, but also how to spend it, that we'll have a better understanding of our priorities coming the next year and the year after, because a budget is not just how we're spending money, but also where we're getting the money from. So because we've had a lot of businesses slow down in this season, a few are picking up now, and we've also had a lot of people lose their 
their source of income and are unable to afford a lot of things that they used to, but also people are generally spending a lot less than they have previously been spending for different reasons. And so it would be, we hope that this conversation will also highlight the, <clears throat> the way government is going to raise money and how it will look at the different realities for people in the process of raising the money. But also to see that the most important for many Ugandans might be the conversation on health and economics, because um, these times have made, have affected our health sector more than they have before, but also economics in terms of how our businesses that are struggling now are going to be supported, where's that money going to come from and how does government intend to spend it, but also the question of, of debt. We've received um, quite an amount of money from our partners, our development partners, and to see how we are going to spend that money in the time to come and what it also means for our debt repayment process, because we've already been in great debt uh, prior to all of this. So um, I would like to thank our panelists for sharing their time and their expertise with us today. It's a very busy season, especially for Miss Margaret Kakande and Sophie and Rebecca, because men, they do work around the budget directly. So I'm sure this season is very busy. So we would like to take this opportunity to thank you so much for making time to share your time and your expertise with us. I would also like to thank the team from Akina, Naya and your entire team. Thank you for putting this together. And um, I wish you all a very fruitful discussion. Back to you, Sarah. And Sarah, thank you for moderating our discussion today. We appreciate it. Um, thank you, Maria. Uh, I'd like to request the host. I think you can now turn on your video. I finally found the little thing. Um, you can now turn on your video. Perfect. Oh, it took a while, but we're there. <laughs> Uh, Sarah, sorry, uh, Sarah, you're muted. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Ah, yeah, thank you very much, Maria and Leah, for setting the agenda for the meeting. And uh, Maria hinted on the rising foreign debt. Our debt to GDP ratio is a few points below 50%, and we hope the expert from the Minister of Finance will share more insights on that. And we also know that about 13 trillion in the budget is set aside for just debt servicing and repayment. But also during COVID, we have had a multitude of supplementary budgets in preparation for the pandemic with the little being seen on the ground, including absence of personal protection equipment for health workers. So these are some of the challenges and views that are on people's minds when it comes to budget, the situation we are in, and when, especially the budget committee passed the budget without aligning it strictly to the COVID needs of the people. And, and the minister said they would do the realignment later, and that really we've left many citizens puzzled. But without saying a lot, I want to invite the experts. And first is Madame Sophie Nampel from the Budget Advocacy Group. She is the budget policy specialist. Sophie will take us through the analysis of the budget, the breakdown of critical allocations budget items, especially those responding to the pandemic and what are government priorities within this budget. Sophie, you're welcome. You have uh, about 20 minutes for your presentation. The floor is open, Sophie. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, good morning to you and everyone. I'm hoping everyone is okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you to uh, present or and also bring to you what we, we see coming through in the budget. This is a great opportunity for myself but also for CSBAG to be able to interact with and also bring to the knowledge of many others 
what is happening in the budget. When we see more groups pick interest in this, it's, it uh, excites us and also uh, gives us energy as we are, it, it shows that we have more groups coming together to take part in the drive to have a citizens-centered budget. Um, I think uh, the person from Akinamama could help me share my screen so that I can take us through what I have prepared. Sarah, I'm hoping I can be able to fit within the 20 minutes that you've given me. And I hope after that we can have a, a good discussion about what's coming through in the budget. Kindly guide me on how to have my screen shared. I tried and I don't think I can do it from my side. Can I? Okay. But you can proceed as Leia tries to share the screen. Ah, it's on. Great. So um, I'm going to take us through a presentation that, that uh, shows us what is coming through in the budget and what should we expect from what the minister might read, will read tomorrow and indicate a few indicate and show a few indications that might have to change. First of all, I have to mention that this budget, like Sarah mentioned, as she was uh, uh, bringing me on board, this budget was prepared without COVID-19 in mind. The time COVID came into Uganda, we were almost at the tail end of uh, the budget process. So most of what I'm going to present does not have an indication of COVID-19, especially for the figures that we see coming through in the budget. So we should expect the budget to, to change as we move on. Uh, we should expect to have uh, changes here and there, cuts from one point to another, and reprioritization of areas of financing in the budget in the next financial year. So before I get into the detail, I'll let you know what CSBAG is. We are a coalition of currently more, slightly more than 100 members and were formed in 2004, basically to increase the voice of civil society of citizens representation to influence government decisions on resource mobilization and utilization for, uh, for development within the country, but also to ensure that each one of us is not left behind. Each one of us gets a representation financially in, in line with the budget that all of us as Ugandan citizens are catered for. So our main vision is to ensure that we have a people-centered budget that dignifies humanity. We don't leave out the children, we don't leave out the elderly, we don't leave out the youth, and also the different groups, if it's farmers, if it's private sector, everyone is catered for within the budget. Everyone gets a share of what's coming through in the money that we put together. Um, just to add on to what I mentioned of, for our budget that's coming through in financial year 2020, 2021, we are getting into a year that is taking up from financial year 1920, where financial year 1920 has had quite a number of um, incidents going on. I'll call them incidents. One, we had the lock, we have, we still have, although the conversation has gone down a bit, the locust invasion. We have rising water levels on water bodies that are affecting many that live around them, and we still, affecting them in ways we have floods and but we also have landslides in some places because of the rains that are coming through and then we have the big disease that has taken over the world globally and finally got to Uganda and is also have we, we have numbers growing from it uh, that is the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic we've experienced a lockdown which is the first for many of us and increased expenditure to the health sector to see how we reduce the spread of this fast growing disease that seems not to affect just the health sector but everything else around it. 
We've seen slow down business operations. We've seen tourism go down, which is one of our income generating uh, areas in the country. That means we are having less money come through in the country, which means that that brings implications on the budget moving forward. And the increasing spread of COVID-19 is also a threat. As for those who have been following the news, we've seen that uh, the medical personnel are being affected now, which, is, which becomes a, 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 an issue of concern for us who have no medical experience, but run to the medical personnel to help us. If they are not there, then we have a very big challenge then. So looking at that and uh, the way we, the, the, the economy is operating, what do we see coming through in the financial year 2020-2021 budget? I'm going to look at the revenue resources. Where do we expect to get money from? The proposed expenditure, what had we proposed? I'm saying had we because we expect to have this budget change uh, in terms of looking at what's coming through from COVID-19. So the proposed expenditure, looking at as the budget was, the time it was passed by parliament. And then prioritization areas through the budget strategy. Uh, I'm hoping we all know that the budget strategy kicks us off for the, for the budgeting process. So areas that were highlighted around September by the Minister of Finance on, the, on what we are going to focus on for financial year 2020-2021 and what will guide our discussion on how we are moving in terms of implementation, what we see coming through from the sectors. So to start us off with the resource envelope for financial year 2020-2021, uh, Sarah earlier mentioned that we have a budget of 45.5 trillion, which yes, when you look at the figures, that is what we are mentioned, we are informed of having or we expect, but like I've, I've, I've mentioned on the side, our total resource envelope is 34.5 trillion. That is how much we should look at uh, that will be invested or will be spent in terms of what we want to see coming through in financial year 2020-2021. Why do I say that? When you look at the table, we have domestic revenue, these are the sources of revenue that we expect to get, but some of it is not really ours. Government will look at it as revenue, yes, but government has to pay back this money. It's not fully government's money. So we have a 45.5 trillion budget, but this budget will reduce in terms of how much we have to spend. So we expect to collect about 21.7 trillion that's from the Revenue Authority. Uh, that's the projection that we've been given, which is a slight increase from the 20.6 that we had for financial year 19.20. There is uh, domestic financing that government will be uh, acquiring, but this comes through in terms of, let me call it a loan. Uh, government borrows internally, and that helps to implement its to finance its expenditure, but this money has to be paid back later on. So it's looked at as a debt in a way. Uh, domestic refinancing, government will be paying some of the debts that it, it has internally. So that's why I've highlighted those two areas. We see them as part of our revenue, but they are not actually monies we are going to spend. Uh, we expect budget support of about 2.9 trillion and project support of 9.6 trillion. So that is what our budget looks like. And uh, when you look at that, it goes back to what I said. We have, if, if you're to look at money in your pocket, you will say, in my pocket, I have uh, 34 trillion that I can spend. I might see 45 trillion, but this, I can't tangibly touch all of it because I have to pay some of it back to. Uh, different people. So in total, our external financing will be 12.5 trillion and then the 21.7 trillion, like I mentioned, will be coming from internally. Revenue to expect to collect that in the next financial year. Um, 
looking at that, uh, moving from that, Revenue Authority expects to collect 21.4 trillion. But then looking at how we've performed in financial year 1920, I'll say for the 10 months that, uh, that, that we've got collections come through fully, we've not got how much we collected for May and how much we expect to collect for June. But with what is going on, I wouldn't expect us to have to come up to our full expectations. Uh, looking at 1920 in terms of tax revenue for uh, financial year 1920 that we are currently implementing, we've gone for as far as April 2020, we've got 13.5 trillion, excuse me, of the 18.877 that we anticipated to get from tax revenue alone. And for non-tax revenue, we got 790 billion of the 1,571 trillion that we expected. That would sum up to the 20.4 trillion that revenue authority expected to get. Uh, that comes up to about 14 trillion that we've so far collected, but we are already three quarters into the the financial year, it's almost ending, I might say. And from that, we are seeing a shortage of 2.09 billion, 2.1 trillion, which uh, looking at things, I don't think in the next two months with what is going on, we'll be able to get a lot more and hit a surplus that will help us cover most of this. So moving into financial year 2020, 2021, where we expect 21.4 trillion to be collected, of which 19.9 trillion will be from the tax revenue and 1.5 will be from non-tax revenue. It might be a challenge for us to collect what we uh, anticipate to collect given the COVID-19 times that we are in right now. Um, there were tax proposals that were made on where some of this money will come from in the next financial year. I highlighted just a few that I thought were interesting, but I also provide a link for us to look at what is coming through. On the CSBAG website, there's a, a detailed tax proposals on what is coming through from the different taxes that government collects. Is it income tax, is it stamp duty, is it excise duty? In those different taxes, tax forms, there are proposals that government has made for the next financial year to collect taxes. So the, the, the ones I thought I could share here, one is under income tax. Uh, government has reached a point where I would say it's tired of having people declare losses year in, year out. So one can only declare up to five years you declare losses, but after that, you will re be requested to pay 0 0.5 of your gross income. So every time you, you, you can, you're allowed to declare losses, but not for more than five years. After the five years, you'll be expected to pay a small tax to government, uh, just so we don't have many people declare losses over time and have government lose out on that revenue. Then stamp duty uh, for all people who have professional documents, licenses, certificates, a fee of 100,000 shillings is going to be imposed on attaining each of those. Um, from our side as CSBAG, we think putting a definite figure is a bit of a challenge because of the valuation or devaluation of the, of the shilling. So it would be better if we use currency points, although this, this is something we, we commend, but use of currency points could be more uh, effective than putting an actual value in case we come 10 years from now and 100,000 is no longer as valuable as it was in 2020. Um, to be exempted from payment, this is for investors. An investor should have the capacity to at least source 50% of locally produced raw materials. We've had a number of people who have been exempted and 
government has come to realize that most of these exemptions are not really benefiting our people are not benefiting Ugandans. So at least one, the, the investor to be exempted should source 50% of locally produced raw materials. Although we also think this, should, this percentage can also still be increased if the, if the, the resources are, if the raw materials are available, it can still go higher, maybe to 70 or 80%. Uh, then the capacity to employ a, a minimum of 100 citizens so that our people are able to attain employment or get jobs and not have uh, foreigners being brought in to fill up, for example, a factory and there are barely any Ugandans being employed. So those are some commendable tax proposals that are coming through in the next financial year. So now, after we've seen where we expect to get revenue and how much we expect to get, this is how the, the graph you're looking at is how we expect to have this money shared. How is it going to be broken down and how does it compare with financial year 1920? We see works and transport still taking a big chunk of the uh, budget that we expect just like it did in financial year 1920. And trade and industry, one of the areas that we need to have investment in as it brings in revenue to us is taking the smallest proportion. It's taking 162 billion from the, from the national cake. And I will still insist this budget was without consideration of COVID-19. So there will be changes moving forward. Um, tourism that generates uh, quite a big amount of, of revenue for the country expects to receive 197 trillion, 197 billion, sorry, in the next financial year. And health, one of the sectors that is pretty critical in the situation we are going through now, expects to receive 2.7 uh, trillion in the next financial year. I still insist these are bound to change, but that is how the budget that was approved by parliament stands at the moment. Our local governments expect to receive 4.2 trillion in the next financial year, of which three quarters of it is going to recurrent expenditure. So we have 2.8 trillion going to paying salaries, paying wages, paying utilities for the local governments, which is a big cost to um, government, given that local governments are supposed to be our, our main service provi provision uh, center, if I may call it that. And it expects, um, we expect to have 972.6 billion uh, expenditure that is development at the local governments. In my view, this should be more than what we are spending on recurrent and also what is going to the local governments from the central government, since this is the nearest unit to service provision. Pension payments will take 361, 362 billion of the 4.2 trillion that local governments are receiving in the next financial year. So moving from what we expect to have, uh, how the cake will be shared, what was coming through in the strategy of fi for financial year 2020-2021. The budget strategy focused on four critical areas that were meant to create jobs for the, for, for the population and also increase exports so that we are able to earn more from what goes out of our country. And one of the areas is agriculture and agro-industrialization. There is tourism, which is still a, a, a critical sector in the, in the country's income generation, since we have many recreational areas that uh, earn, earn uh, income to the country. Improving value addition to tradable minerals and commodities and also enhancing efficiency in public investments in provision and maintenance of productive and trade infrastructure, provision of health services, and skills development programs. I, I'll focus on three areas. 
I left out the value addition to tradable minerals and commodities, uh, given that most of what we would um, like to focus on is what relates directly with the populations which relates to the social sectors. So in my next slides, the focus will be on agriculture and agro-industrialization, tourism development, and also enhancing efficiency in public investment. So some of the proposals to address the 2020-2021 strategy following those four key areas, under agriculture and agro-industrialization, government intends to organize farmers into cooperatives to encourage value addition of produce so that we don't sell our maize as seeds, but we add something. Maybe we, make, we sell it as flour or people make cookies in a bakery or something like that, so that we are able to earn a bit more from our produce. Strengthening enforcement of regulations for standards and quality assurance. Many of us know that our agricultural produce has had issues because of quality, and that stems right from the seedlings that one uses or the, the, the fertilizers that they put into, this, into their, their gardens or farms, they will affect what you get out at the end. So ensuring that the produce, the, 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 the inputs that we are using are up to the required standards, that will help us improve the quality that we will be getting at the end. Facilitating market access for agricultural products through export development, we have seen many challenges in finding markets for our farmers or what they produce in the in what what comes out of, of the gardens. They don't uh, compete favorably sometimes on the world market, but also the, nego the negotiating power might not be as strong as it should be on the on the internal market. So government intends to facilitate that and increase access for most of our produce through export development. Streamlining financing of agriculture and attracting investors into the sector. For those who have been following the president and some of his uh, addresses, he's focused, he's been saying a lot about capitalizing UDB so that manufacturers, farmers, other investors internally are able to access financing in order to, to increase production within the country. And leaving alone UDB, the agricultural credit facility is still running and still providing the required financing to those who meet the, the requirements that are set out. Moving from agriculture to tourism, for tourism, focus will be on provision of adequate tourism infrastructure. We've heard from those who are into the tourism industry mentioned that the roads are usually not good that lead to really, really beautiful areas within our country. So government would like to focus on improving the roads there, regional aerodromes, water and sanitation facilities on the tourism sites. You do not want to have people get to a place where they need to wash their hands and there's no water. And then reliable ICT facilities and that will require the input of NITAU to improve network coverage countrywide. Um, still under tourism, there is incentivizing private sector investments in world-class holiday or leisure facilities so that we, have, we are able to attract all kinds of tourists and they don't have uh, challenges here and there about accommodation or where they will stay worrying about where they will be while they go to these beautiful sites. Those are two of the areas that government would like to, to focus on in the next financial year. Under enhancing efficiency in public investments, um, one is strengthening the supply chain for medicines and medical supplies to improve the availability of medicines and ensure accountability for medicines. We've seen over and over the challenges that are faced by the health sector in terms of medical supplies and equipment and also the medical personnel, things like that that are able to support the smooth operation of the health sector. So government would like to focus on strengthening that supply chain. We have medicines move, NMS is able to provide the medicines required 
to the different health centers and those are accessed by the different by the citizens but also accountability measures when these medicines are delivered how are they uh, used by the citizens are they accessed by the citizens or do they channel them to private pharmacies like we witnessed earlier in the year investing in prevention and management of non-communicable diseases by expanding geographical coverage of services we've seen a number of areas that don't have uh, referral hospitals and government wants to focus on ensuring that one they are specialized uh, medical centers but also uh, each region has at least a referral hospital that is well equipped, that has the required resources that are needed or services, provides the required services, even specialized services at most of these centers so that you don't have many people coming into the city center because they believe that all the services are in Mulago and they cannot access them, for example, in Mbali, something of the sort. Government would like to reduce on that and ensure that there is geographical coverage of the required health services countrywide. Increasing the capitalization of the government-owned commercial banks to avail capital at lower rates. This speaks to public investments so that we are able to have enough, uh, people are able to access money at lower interest rates, which has been a real challenge for many is especially the private sector, which invests a lot in our economy. Enhancing the investment and industrialization role of government through strengthening the role of Uganda Development Corporation. Um, the president has also been emphasizing that, that they're going to capitalize UDC, but also UD, Uganda Development Bank, so that there is financing or there is money that is available for those who are interested in investing, both from government and also from the private sector. Reviving and strengthening the cooperative movement, this is in terms of value addition, in terms of trade, in terms of increasing productivity. Uh, government would like to revive uh, the cooperatives that many of us have year in, year out requested that are reinstated to help with value addition, but also to help with bringing farmers together to increase access to markets, but also negotiating power for most of uh, the produce that, is, that comes out or even the commodities that are produced. Then not nurturing local enterprises for participation in local, regional, and global product value chains. We have we have quite a lot as Uganda. We are a very rich country. We are able to produce a lot in terms of agriculture, but we've not been able to participate well or to compete favorably at the regional and global uh, levels. And government intends to have this come through, nurturing the local enterprises to build their standards, their quality, so that they are able providing guidance basically so that they're able to compete favorably on the world or regional markets. Um, so moving from that, um, where, as I mentioned earlier, the, we expect to have the budget change uh, given what is coming through from COVID-19. So I thought I'd highlight some areas um, basically focusing on the social sectors that could be prioritized moving forward with COVID-19. In case there are changes, what are some of the areas that should be looked at? And these were basically informed by the ministerial policy statements that were put out by the respective ministries, departments, and agencies on their budgeting for the next financial year. These are some of the challenges that have been coming through in these sectors that can be focused on with the situation we are in uh, to promote, to, to, to help us move forward and develop in financial year 2020-2021. So starting with the health sector, one is sufficiently facilitating health workers through one payment of their salaries and allowances and also increasing their interest in regional hospitals or health centers. 
providing required medical supplies and equipment, including personal protective equipment. Uh, COVID-19 has helped bring out some of the really, really terrible challenges we've been facing. Many of them we've been singing about year in, year out, but it has helped show how critical addressing some of these are. And for health, looking at where we have some of our health workers uh, affected now, sick with COVID-19 because they lack the personal protective equipment. But also before that, we've been seeing them requesting that their salaries are increased by government. And also there's been a continuous challenge of government forwarding health workers to uh, places, let me say, up country outside uh, the city center, but many are not able to report because the, the equipment, the services that are there are not as favorable and they would rather decline their employment opportunity in government to work in a, in a remote area than go and provide services with the remoteness that might be at the respective health center. So if the regional hospitals, for example, or regional health centers are developed, we could have more health workers being interested in working uh, in different areas and not just focus on the city center in Kampala. Underwater in an environment, uh, COVID-19 requires people to wash their hands, wash their hands, wash their hands. But we've still been having challenges of access to uh, water in some areas. And I'll add on to access to clean and safe water. Um, up, up to about 65% of the population of the country was covered, but still the 35 that still there still needs to have access to clean and safe water to reduce on some of the diseases that could uh, be spread through lacking water services. But also sectors like agriculture need water for production. So increasing water for production is still critical in terms of promoting the agriculture sector like government would like to. Under the education sector, like health workers, teachers also need to be facilitated so that they're able to provide their services to our pupils, to our children, to our students at any time without any inconveniences. Providing schools with required scholastic materials. Uh, we've seen many schools that don't have books, that don't have textbooks to use, they don't have the desks that they need, which if, even the classrooms themselves, the infrastructure, which is necessary to promote uh, skills development and learning. Uh, promoting skills development is still critical in order to complement but also be able to um, be able to do hand related uh, things that generate income later on and not focus on just the formal education. Then facilitating with COVID-19, facilitating continuous learning even when at home. We've seen challenges where many are not able to access TVs and radios. How do they manage to continue studying when they are, they are not able to go to schools. We've seen the Ministry of Education come through and provide materials. Are they sufficient? Are they easy to understand? These are all areas that need to be looked into as we move into financial year 2020-2021. For agriculture, this is a sector that through COVID-19 has shown us how critical it is to the Ugandan population, but also the Ugandan economy. So the need to increase production and productivity. How is our quality, uh, our produce, is our produce up to the required standards? Things of the sort are, are inevitable to look, to look at in financial year 2020-2021. Promoting value addition, increasing market access for agricultural produce. And that I've just indicated on the need that government wants to bring back the cooperatives to be able to increase both value addition, but also access to markets. For social development, through COVID-19, we've seen a number of vices come through, 
Recently, we witnessed over 60 girls impregnated during the lockdown. We've had GBV cases come through over and over again, but we still have challenges of our community development offices barely financed or barely facilitated to do their work of sensitizing, of ways, raising awareness, but also in some instances managing or forwarding the cases that come through to the respective offices. So looking at facilitation for the CDO offices, countrywide is still crucial, and also the other offices that work with them, like the police, the probation office, and uh, the community local councils, these are all essential in helping to raise awareness and also manage some of these vices that are in our communities. Uh, so moving forward with financial year 2020-2021 budget with COVID, um, what do we see coming through? First of all, with COVID, we've been able to see uh, a lot of assistance from uh, from different development partners helping out or financing, providing grants to Uganda to be able to cope with this pandemic that is going on. From your screen, you can see some of the grants that we've received within the country, Irish Embassy, the European Union, UN agencies, US Mission, among others. But we've also received a loan. This is what you can track at the moment. We've received a loan from the IMF of 491 million. And we hope to have more grants coming through or loans that government might borrow moving forward, depending on how our expenditure is and our revenue flow. But uh, looking at that, how do we still achieve our strategy that we set out last year around September as we're starting the financial year 2020-2021, preparing for uh, the next financial year, even with COVID-19. Uh, from the lockdown, we realized a slow, we realized that businesses were slowing down and many things were not working as, as expected. So some changes have been made, both to support government, but also to support the private sector that generates a lot of income that government is looking at to finance our budget in financial year 2020-2021. So some of the flexibilities that have been done, one is allowing corporations to delay payment of corporation tax or presumptive tax uh, between April and June. And for tourism, manufacturing and horticulture, that's been deferred up until September. These might still be revised depending on how the situation goes, but being able to defer payment of taxes helps uh, some of them, some of these corporations realize uh, how much they can save during this time and be able to pay later when situations change. Um, there is a provision of an additional 300 billion to boost agricultural productivity and production uh, for seedlings, fertilizers, irrigation, among others. And there is specific focus on a number of crops, specifically coffee, cotton, tea, palm oil, and other oil seeds, cassava, maize, cocoa, and then dairy products, beef, fish, milk, dairy, and fish production. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, COVID-19 has indicated how crucial, how important, how uh, critical our agriculture sector is. So promoting it from this, it, this time gives us a kickstart of how do we block the challenges that we have within the sector to have it thrive, uh, not just for 2020, 2021, but even beyond, because this is the backbone of the country. We can uh, benefit more from it by adding value, by increasing the, the quality of what we produce, and also increasing our production itself. So government is going to focus greatly on agriculture production, but also manufacturing and industry to ensure that we add value to whatever we produce and not sell it on as is basis uh, when we get the produce from the markets, for example. 
uh, expedite payment of outstanding value addition tax refunds. This is a source of revenue to those that have that are expecting refunds to government. So government expects to expedite those, but also pay domestic areas for goods and services supplied to government by the private sector. We know government is the biggest uh, employer for private sector, if I may say that. Uh, employer doesn't come out well, but it, it provides the biggest business to the private sector. And when government fails to pay uh, the private sector, there are hitches in, in, in the operations of business. So government hopes to clear all areas to ensure that the private sector continues operating, even with the challenges that are being faced in businesses with COVID-19. We know many- Sophie can, you, Sophie, can you please conclude? Sure, I'm concluding, I'm on the last slide. Uh, we know many businesses operate on loans and with COVID-19 and the lockdown, there has been a, a slowdown in business. So government hopes to, government has worked with uh, different commercial banks through the Bank of Uganda to ensure that they allow an extension of repayment of, of loans, repayment periods be extended, but also postponement of loan repayment for a given period of time and also relaxing conditions for non-performing loans to reduce on the pressure that is coming through from for private sector, for example, in terms of uh, investment, but also needing to pay back uh, these respective loans, especially with the interest rates that are high. Capitalization of UDC, I mentioned that earlier, to invest in strategic areas, but also capitalization of UDB to finance productive investments, boosting uh, Uganda Industrial Research Institute to continue with innovation research and incubation for business startups. We've realized it's crucial for us to reduce on our inputs and substitute them internally. So with the innovations, we can have more uh, come through to help uh, substitute our inputs. And securing funding for the development of Kampala Industrial Business Park at Namave and power transmission to different substations to remove the glitches that some of the businesses uh, incur in terms of power shortages or uh, inability to access power to be able to continue with production. That's my presentation. I thank you for listening to me. Yeah, thank you very much, Sophie. Before I let you off the hook, I want your comment on two issues. One, if you look at the most funded areas in our budget, mm. number one is transport at 6.4 trillion, number two is finance at 5.8 trillion, we have security at 4.5 trillion. Then we have, of course, debt servicing, which is also a very high amount and classified expenditure 2.8 trillion. Do you think these are our priorities as a nation, even in the absence of COVID? And then question number two is on areas for realignment of the budget in line with COVID. We all know that we are living under the new normal. Even in the post-COVID era, we can still do virtual meetings like we are doing today. We still don't have our government officers going abroad for treatment and nobody has died. So is it possible to cut money on foreign travels, treatment abroad and workshops so that we fund the new priorities, especially health, and social security or social protection for the citizens in the budget. Thank you, Sarah. I'll start with the second one. And it seems you've been, it feels like you've been part of our discussions here at CSBAG. Yes, it's possible to cut down on these and there are proposals we are giving to government on some of the areas to cut down on to secure some revenue uh, moving forward. Uh, welfare and entertainment. Right now, we've seen with COVID, we've realized we can have national celebrations without bringing, spending millions and millions of money and bringing 
many people together. We've had uh, we've had foreign travels being put to a stop, and no one has died because of that, or business has not stopped because of that. These are proposals we are making to government, and we realize we can make a, a, a huge saving. I unfortunately don't have the figure right now, but we had done a calculation of how much we can save when we cut out most of these expenditures that that could be some are negatory, some might not be negatory, but we can't really do away with the, without them in a particular moment of time. So yes, we can save quite a lot. And these are areas that government will look at, uh, is looking at, not will look at, areas government is looking at to secure some financing for the next financial year. And also some that can wait to have the priority areas like, sec priority sectors like health, take up the required resources. Um, going back to your first question, are these areas of prioritization, looking at transport, interest payments, security? Um, before I, I respond to this, I'll, I'll, I'll want to explain that a budget is a political tool. It is something that is looked at by the technical, but you also have the political side that has an, a manifesto that they have to implement and are looking at. So issues of security, classified expenditure, for a normal economist like me, I could say they are not priority areas, they could wait, but the political side might say otherwise. So usually it's coming to terms, what do we cut out, what do we live in, negotiating and coming to a middle ground. I, I, I must say interest payments is beyond our control. This is money we, we, we get that we have to pay back. So it's not about prioritizing it. It is something that you have to oblige to, to fulfill your commitment or your side of, of yes, your, of your commitment. And for transport, it might, in some, some areas might be a priority, some might not be. I was part of the finance team, I would advise otherwise, because that's something that can wait. And also, given the situation that we are in, we, we, it wouldn't be advisable to take up a loan to do that. But those that are already up and running have to continue running. So transport, works and transport might take up a big chunk, and it might not be a prioritization for us, but then moving from where we've come from, we have commitments that we made to it that we are still uh, implementing. So we can't really cut out. So just to go back to your question, they might not be priority areas, but because of commitments or uh, or decisions we've made before, they come through and continue running as we go. So some of these, it's not about cutting down on this, cutting down on that. It's looking into the detail and seeing what is this financing for. Is it uh, government revenue? Is it uh, Ugandan revenue that is going into this that we can uh, stop and take to another place? Or is it a project? If it's something that is already tied and we can't change, even during this time, it might not be possible for us to cut down on it. Thank you very much, Sophie. And I think I will give you a break at that moment until we pick comments from the audience and, and our chat. Participants can type questions in, on our chat, and then we shall have the, the last session also for participants' interaction. At this juncture, I would like to invite our second speaker, Madame Rebecca Atwine, who is the, so if you can put your screen down, who is the head of programs at the uh, Forum, for Forum for Women in Democracy. And Rebecca will 
share comments on whether marginalized and most vulnerable groups are taken care of in the government priorities or whether the budget responds to challenges that have arisen because of the pandemic, implications and measures that are likely to be instituted in, in case of revenue shortfalls and recommendations for both government and civil society. Sophie, we still see your screen. You can uh, bring it down. You can bring it down and uh, Rebecca, the floor is open. You're welcome to share your comments. Thank you, Sarah. And my fellow panelists, uh, my name again is Twine Hope Rebecca Arinitwe. I am a program manager. I work with FORWARD, which is Forum for Women in Democracy as a program manager for gender and economic justice. This is what we do at Ford. Ford, we promote gender equality in all areas of decision-making through capacity development, community empowerment, policy engagement, and strategic partnerships. I am stepping in for my colleague who was supposed to be with you uh, Juliet Odoi, she got an emergency. So I basically don't have a presentation which is uh, made, which has been prepared, but I have some good notes that I've written down that I'll be able to share with you. Uh, going straight to going straight to the question, I don't know how much time I have, but it's not so long. Going back to the question, the first one was yeah, if the Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, if the marginalized and the most vulnerable, particularly the women, are adequately captured within the government priorities. My question is both a yes and a no, uh, because there are some areas where those marginalized groups have been captured, but there are many areas where the specific groups have not been captured. Vulnerable, we look at a variety of people. We have uh, not necessarily only the women, we have persons with disability, we have people who stay in hard to reach areas, all those kinds of people I don't think were thought about while we planned for all this in some specific areas. Now looking at the focus of our budget this year, financial year 2021, that is going to be read tomorrow, but I think which has already been completed, our focus was on increasing agriculture and production, agriculture production and productivity. We are looking at lowering the cost of doing business, expanding access to serviced industrial land, and then also building skilled and healthy labor force. Now, those are the focus. That is the focus so far. And of course, all that can be fit in the different sectors that have been given quite a sum of money. But just to pick out the key, the key sectors that address the focus that I've been talking about, we're looking at the infrastructure, we're looking at security, we're looking at agriculture, education, works and transport. Those seem to be the key sectors now. If I'm to answer the question whether those, those vulnerable groups have been captured, when we look at, at infrastructure, I would say, yes, a bit of it, because when you look at the focus under infrastructure, we actually intend to work on the road network that has been on and ongoing, the standard gauge railway, and then we are looking at Kavali Airport, and then Ukasa and Ginger Ports, and many other places that we are going to work on with that money, which is about 5.8 trillion. In one or the other, I think this helps but I'm not looking at a place where they're talking about uh, where they're talking about people that live in hard to reach areas, people that live in islands. We have women that struggle to get to health centers in such places. I don't see where they are thought about because then we look at the road network and yet we have a good amount of money. 
And I don't think it's only going to deal with only that infrastructure. I think they're also going to, to do with infrastructure in agriculture and many other areas. I would hope so. If that is the case, then I would think the women have been considered partly in infrastructure. When it comes to security, I think the biggest budget of security is going to cater for elections. Yet we have issues of protection, uh, with the rise in GBV, gender-based violence, I don't think they have catered for protection in that specific area, especially at the local governments. At the center, yes, there's a bit of it, though not much and not thought about critically, but I think this, this emphasis is needed more for the local governments, like my colleague, my fellow panelist mentioned, Sophie, when you're talking about the community-based services, then you're looking at the protection offices, they are so underfunded. And it becomes difficult when they have to deal with gender-based violence because with security, that falls under security and it needs to be addressed. Agriculture, yes, she talked elaborately about the about uh, production and productivity, which I'll also tackle, but I think that has been thought about and the women have been also captured in that area. It seems to suggest also that the budget is pro-youth. Although I have not seen the specific areas because the youth tend to get attracted, the women and the men tend to get attracted to areas of ICT, and yet I see the budget of ICT has actually not increased, has remained the same. Then we're talking about education, uh, which is also key, which is pertinent. And uh, special focus was given to, it's going to be given to the lecturers. I think they've set aside 50 billion to pay the lecturers and the scientists. That is good to know. But uh, I think a few will be able to benefit, not very many more. Under works and transport, we also note that they, they are going to be able to give motor, motorcycles of about 24 billion to the local governments and also bicycles of about 20 billion also to the local governments. I would say this captures a bit the needs of the people in the rural areas, especially, uh, like I say, they work for Forum for Women in Democracy. So I'll focus more on the women and looking at their challenges they face when they have to access their markets and health centers, this would be of great importance. So we pray that actually the bikes are delivered and the, and the, and the bicycles are delivered. Now, agriculture. We know that agriculture is an avenue for economic inclusion. It employs about 70% of the population, mostly women and youth. So the other bulk of the women is actually in the informal sector. So we look at both agriculture where we are concentrating on subsistence farming, and then we also look at the informal sector. That is where the bulk, the biggest number of the women is for now. So in agriculture, yes, it's good we have noted all those, so we are happy that they've been captured, but we're going to look at areas which specifically need to be addressed for them to benefit from that that we are talking about. Um, there, are some, there are some categories of, of people or of women that have not been catered for because of their unique challenges. Persons with disability. Uh, during the lockdown, we were able to have time to look at the different uh, stories that we are coming along and, and watching what people go through. And I was able to look at a certain woman who was struggling with, uh, with, uh, with two children who had a disability and could not even get to hospital. So you look at their specific needs, yes, and not directly catered for under a unique category of people. So when we leave those ones out, I would think that we have not considered them in our budgeting. So I think that also has to be considered. 
So answering my first question, I think I would say partially the vulnerable people have been accommodated in the budget, but there are specific areas where they have not been accommodated. The second question that I want to go to is, does the budget respond to the challenges that have arisen because of the pandemic? I would say, I don't think so. Most of the challenges that have come up have not been addressed. Uh, we hoped that before they passed the budget, they would look at those different challenges and address them, but we were assured that the budget is flexible, it could be adjusted along the way. But if something is not planned for, it is hard to think about it once we roll on. So one of the things that I want to talk about, one of the challenges that I think is so critical that was not addressed is gender-based violence. Sophie mentioned it a bit, but I want to stress a little bit more this is one of the areas that was not thought about. In the reports that came up, just in the first 30 days of the lockdown, we had 3,280 cases, which translates to five cases per hour. And just this morning, while we're reading in our reports as for we, we heard that about 30 cases have been reported to the protection office related to GBV. So, I think this is an area that we have ignored as government or as, I don't know, which I think needs to be thought about. Because having 56% of the women experiencing violence before the age 15 and about 28% between uh, 15 and 49 years, that is a big percentage that needs to be thought about. So. Uh, I think a lot of thinking was not put into gender-based violence and the specific sectors that would have actually addressed gender-based violence, we have the social development sector and uh, its budget did not increase at all. It still stands at 172 billion, shilling, billion shillings and yet we know that that is a critical area. And for sure, we all don't know for how long we're going to be locked down. Yes, we did a phased release. There was a phased release of people to go and do bits of work, but we're also watching that the numbers are increasing. And because of that, we cannot be sure whether there won't be more time because of the numbers that are increasing. So I think there's need to think about this in a specific way. I don't know that it is going to be a separate budget from this, from separate from the different sectors that address the issue, or thinking about it and fitting it in one of the critical sectors, maybe the local governments and the social development sector and police, that is the law, the justice law and order sector. Those are the key sectors that probably would have been given money to address that. The, the justice and law sector's budget was increased to two, to two trillion. But at the same time, I think one of the reasons is because of the lockdown extension and also because of the elections. But I don't think the idea of GBV was thought about in this place. The other challenge that came as a result of the pandemic was loss of jobs and layoffs. And particularly in the informal sector, we have had a number of people have been laid off and uh, companies cannot be able to pay them. And those are specifically those who are receiving money on weekly basis, on a daily basis, that they were receiving daily wage. Now those ones were laid off. I don't see any specific plan to cater for these kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Because we know that about 48%, uh, this is from the demographic 
household survey that 48% more women engage, are engaged in self-employment. So that's why I said earlier on that the bulk of the women are either in the agriculture sector or in the informal sector, and they are not catered for in a certain way. Their, their uniqueness should be also thought through because they should have been able to get decent jobs and be able to and, and be assured of money at the end of the month, but they are not. They have to struggle on their own and make sure they make ends meet. Now, if that is not addressed, and we are talking about quality life in the NDP3 goal, the quality of life improved, I don't know how this can be improved when their specific needs are not addressed in the budget. All these things we see that they are going to recapitalize or they've recapitalized the Uganda Development Bank, all these might not directly address the concerns of these kinds of people. Why? They do not have the documentation that they need. They do not have all the necessary requirements to get into this space and get the income that they need either to start or to proceed with any kind or line of business. So in one or the other, their quality of life is affected. My third challenge that I think was not addressed is that some of the people have lost a lot of money, especially those who had small businesses, and so they don't even have capital to start again. We are talking about recovery, we are talking about post-COVID, but it doesn't look like post-COVID yet. And yet that this season is still going on. And a number of them have lost money. Some probably had um, loans from circles, others had borrowed from other places. Uh, because of their kind of work, you find that they have to depend on uh, informal borrowing, loan sharks. And so it is going to be hard for these kinds of people to either bounce back into business or start off again. And so we are yet to see the more, the, the abbreviated impact of such a thing. Rebecca? Yes, please. Yeah, and on that point, as you try to sum up, mm -hmm. do you think the vulnerable and marginalized groups will qualify to access the loans being availed at the Uganda Development Bank as economic stimulus package? Will the vulnerable youth, women, have the requirements for bank loans? Will they have a stimulus access stimulus package? No, I don't think they will. For the few people that I've talked to that have to go through the process of getting loans from such places, it has been a hassle. They don't have the documentation. I was going to come back to that actually and explain it further. There's no way they're going to get that kind of money. You require probably, uh, there's a lot of documentation that is needed for you to qualify to get that loan of low interest. And I don't think they have. So the majority of them will not be able to get the help from the banks. I think the way they can only be helped, which I was going to go to a little later, is through their circles. There's got to be a way how they can help be helped within their circles. The majority of the Ugandan's economy is informal. And the people that are able to get such loans are those who have either previous experience in, 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 in their work and they, are, they can present the documents and they can be believable. But somebody who's just starting off, that is going to be hard to, to be able to get the money that they need. So my answer is no, I don't think they will be helped, especially in the informal sector. Then the other challenge that, that was not addressed, that has come about, by the pandemic is the slowdown in business. Uh, people are struggling a lot because even 
transport, the available transport now is expensive. And for those who are able to watch, I don't know how many days ago, those who that, that bothered and struggled to come to town and do some few, some few things, were stranded in the park and they had to spend the night in the parks. So me, I think that too was not thought through. Yes, it's good to contain the, it's good to contain the pandemic, but we need to think about how to help these kinds of people. How can they be helped? If the transport continues to become expensive and they cannot even afford to come and do the little business that they have to do, that is going to be really, really hard. There's a certain category of people that much as we listened to the State of the Nation address that was not, I don't know whether it was mentioned, I could be right or wrong, maybe it was, that people that are directly affected by the lockdown and the extended lockdown. There are certain categories of people who are still under lockdown. For example, the people that work in bars, the people that work in uh, the beauty parlors, the people that work in spas, they don't have income at all. And they are home. They can't move, their places are locked up, but still they have families to take care of. They have families to, to look after and they don't have any income on them. They don't know how they are going to be helped. So that is another category of people that I wanted to bring across, which I know for sure the budget did not think about. And all this is private sector. And when private sector is not considered and made vibrant, there's no way we can think of how we're going to get government revenue. All these had a contribution in one way or the other. So one of the, the challenges is that those kinds of people that are directly affected by the lockdown have not been thought about. This brings me specifically to the transport challenges. We have transport challenges in the rural areas. These are people who are relying more on, um, on motorbikes to go to their, their different destinations, on, uh, on, pub, on public transport. Now, in town, yeah. in urban centers, in the urban centers, you see you can have private cars and uh, go on with your work. But in the rural, set, in the rural setting, it was mainly public transport and the border borders. All those are not working. Now, if it is this stuff for these kinds of people, we have those who live from islands. How then are they going to be addressed? When we are thinking about the infrastructure and the works and transport, these are the kinds of people that need to be thought about. Guidelines were given on how people are supposed to sit in taxis, how people were supposed to sit in um, all the different kinds of transport that they were mentioning, the trucks, but we didn't hear anything to do with those who have to cross over the lakes, those who have to cross over and use water transport. No guidelines, they were not considered, but that is their only way to survive. So I think the guidelines were given, and because even the guidelines were not given, it shows that even the budget would not think of those kinds of people. So, yeah, really, Sophie, can you conclude? Yes, I'm going to conclude. Oh, yeah, the implication, I... pardon? No, I was asking if you can conclude in one minute. We are running out of time. Okay. Uh, the measures that I wanted to talk about, you talked about the implication of the measures, is that government will most likely, if we, we have uh, these other people who are not pay, who are not uh, doing private business, government is going to continue to deepen the tax base instead of widening it, and that will make it real hard. In one or the other, the startups will be suffocated and entrepreneurship will also be swallowed up. So that is one thing that we need to note. The other, Sophie had talked about, it was about quality with the expansion of the industrial base. So I think that also should be considered. I'm going to the last question, which talks about the recommendations that would give both to government and 
and the civil society. I'm just going to run through, I'm not going to explain them, but just to read them. One of them is to focus on the private sector in order to be able to generate revenue. The focus is yes on the other areas, but key focus should be on the private sector. We should have anti-poverty programs like transforming production from subsistence to medium scale farming. Because the subsistence only caters for food for ha at household level. But if we take it a notch higher and put it at medium scale farming, we'll be able to also enhance the household income, which is in line with the goal of the MDP3. Should there be an avenue, money or money or support should be given to the people directly, not collecting food in one place and then dispersing it. Money should be given directly to the people so that it can boost local trade, restore dignity, and also the cut the costs of storage and discrimination, reduce exposure, and allow people to make choices. I could have food, but not have medicine. So if that money is given directly, instead of getting task forces that collect in one place, increasing the cost, money should be given directly to the people through either mobile money or any other way that is deemed uh, safe so that people can be able to do the purchases on their own. Then money should be set aside to combat gender-based violence. That is a recommendation and I mentioned it a little earlier. We are all going into digitalization, like the way we are having our meeting today. But when you look at our budget also, I see the money, the ICT did not get any increment, so I don't know how that is going to be, but I think it should be thought about. Then having a flexible budget, should any other uh, catastrophe come along, there should be flexibility so that we are able to address those issues. Rural infrastructure. We might think about roads for now, think about the airport, think about the other networks, but the, the, the health infrastructure is key. Because now with the increase in numbers, we do not want to only depend on the makeshift health centers, makeshift health facilities. We want to be able to stand on our own and say we were able uh, to support the people that came to the health centers or came for, uh, for, for assistance because we still have the time to do that. Then long term, I think there should be a conducive environment for the people in the informal sector to be able to formalize their businesses. I think that is how I conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And the participants with questions, please continue to post them in the chat. They will be read out shortly. We are going to have our last speaker, Madam Margaret Kakande. She's the head of budget monitoring and accountability unit at the Ministry of Finance. She will be speaking about the sources of funding for the 45.5 trillion budget and if there are any changes from previous years and how the pandemic has affected this. Also, she will be telling us about trade-offs going to be ensured in the budget to, to ensure the budget objectives are realized and measures that the government will institute in place to ensure that funding of the budget is effectively done and there is effective utilization of funds, especially amidst allegations of corruption and misuse of COVID funds in the last couple of, of months. And then recommendations to government and civil society. You're most welcome, Madam Margaret Kakande. The floor is open. Thank you very much, Sarah. Good afternoon, colleagues and participants. Good afternoon. If, before I go to my question, Sarah, I wanted to make some comments on some of the things my, my colleagues have said, just for correcting the record. I want to begin with uh, Sophie. Sophie, thank you so much for the presentation. Actually, you did give a lot of information as what we are really doing in terms of uh, your recommendations. Just to say that, um, in, actually, we are already shifting. It is true that, um, the budget was passed without thinking of the COVID. Remember that uh, by the time we passed the budget, COVID had just set in. 
and nobody actually knew what the effects of COVID would be. And we had a legal requirement to pass the budget. So the budget was passed. But we do admit that we've gone back to the budget. Actually, the budget has been, we've been doing analysis of the budget to see how we can actually shift some of the, 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 the programs, how we can put some of them on a halt, where we can save money, where we can put the money for us to be able to contain the COVID, but also to ensure that we still have some development going on in the country. So having said that, if you look at, for example, the strategy that we had in place, number two, Sophie, which we are talking about tourism, we've realized that um, during COVID, tourism is something which is not selling. So we're actually stepping back in terms of us doing a lot in that area because we don't know when this uh, COVID will go away. And we all know that with COVID, tourism is almost a dead industry. So focus now is on agriculture as a sector which is resilient, which is actually now the backbone of keeping all of us alive. And also looking at number four, efficiency in public investments. And if you look at the details that are in that area, those are the things we're really doing, looking at issues of um, medicine, looking at the supply chains, how do we ensure that uh, health units have the, the, the equipment, have the, the supplies for them to be able to contain the, the, the disease, how do we prevent and mitigate the, 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 COVID, the COVID, capitalizing the, the, the government commercial banks, you talked about UD, UDB, UDC, so that is already in place. And I think that's where we are actually focusing. But another thing also which we are focusing on, which we are not doing before, is import substitution. We realize that actually we, we have been forced to actually look inwards and see how we can actually manufacture most of our own things and reduce imports from other countries. So we are having a shift there in terms of us manufacturing some of the things actually we are importing. Now, there were some questions in terms of, uh, which were raised by Sarah, that can you look at inland foreign travel, inland travel? I want to inform the, 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 the meeting that even now, before we end this financial year, all departments in government had zero allocations for inland travel, for foreign travel. So all the money that you're saying that is under supplementary, most of this money came from travel, from different departments, from workshops, from meetings. So that has already been done. And we're just going to continue that in the next financial year. Then, Rebecca, there's something which you also talked about, which I thought I would, I would actually mention before I go to my questions. The issue of ICT, and you're saying that uh, you don't see, didn't see uh, a lot of uh, changes in ICT budget, yet we are all now going digital. Yes, we agree that uh, we, we are now going to be E, for example, for us, we say we are going to be an E government. But most of that money which we use, for example, in this ministry, our money is not under ICT. It's under each institution as a recurring cost. So that money you won't be able to see under ICT in terms of the budget for ICT going up. And also the, the fact that the key investment that government has in ICT is laying the national cable. And this is the cable that Nita Yu has been laying down. You always see them digging up the place. And the role of, gov of government is to actually just lay that cable and then let the private sector in terms of uh, communication companies tap onto that, that cable and supply the services. So ICT is basically a private led function. We only have to lay the cable. And right now we are on the last line, what we call the last mile. We are laying that in West Nile. So once that is done, actually you will see very little money going under ICT as a function, a function of government. Then lastly, there was something on um, GBV. Not lastly, second last. GBV, we all are, are agree that we are concerned about this uh, exponential rise in GBV BV crosses. But we should all ask ourselves, what is the best intervention for us to contain this? Should, is it putting money under social development for them to put up shelters? Or for us to look at the structural causes? Where are people violent? If you answer that, you actually realize that most of the money is not going to go under social development. Actually, it will go under other sectors where you have to look at issues of livelihoods. People are stressed because they're not doing anything. They have, don't have money. So if you want people to get money in their households, stop fighting. You don't put money under social development. Then lastly, there was the, um, somebody who talked in passing. This was uh, Rebecca. Um, and I think Sarah also asked 
that you know this money which went in under UDB, would the vulnerable be able to access it? Of course not. And this money was not for vulnerable people. It is for industries, it's for companies, and so on. But government has put money in circles. And I, uh, Rebecca rightly said that that's where we should put money. But we also have another fund, a liquidity fund. They call it Mioga. Mioga is a Nyankole word meaning small basket. And this money is, is being put at the sub-county level. And we are hoping that at sub-county level, using the councillors, this money should be able to be accessed by most of our people who are supposed to, who are said to be vulnerable and they need money to kickstart their activities. Now to my question, sources of funding. Thank you, Sophie. You talked about a, a lot of things in terms of uh, how we are funding, how much money we are putting in. I just want to unpack some of these things for people to appreciate the dilemma that we are being faced with as government in terms of us being able to balance, to balance revenue and expenditure. So in terms of uh, revenue, where does our money come from? We have four sources. The first one is domestic revenue. And this is money which comes from both taxes and from non-tax revenue. And here, yeah, this is things like fees. For example, if you want to get a passport, you pay some money. So in that case, we have, a, and you find that in our budget, most of the money has actually been domestic revenue. Last financial year, it was 71% of the budget was actually financed by domestic revenue. But this had, in our budget proposal right now, it had reduced to 62% because we had already realized that the demands were so high, but, and most of them were actually under infrastructure and we had gone into getting more money through borrowing. The second source of money is domestic borrowing by government. We borrow from the central bank. Now, this is not a good thing for us to do. And we've been borrowing to the level of about 5.9% in terms of funding the, the, the budget. But we know that now everybody is stressed. The private sector is looking for loans. So you can realize that that's not going to be a very good option for, for government in terms of us also rushing to the banks to borrow. We want to leave that and give the private sector space for them to be able to, 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 to use the, the, the banks for borrowing. So that leaves us with two others, the grants through budget support or project support from our development partners. And uh, Sophie gave a, a number of examples of some of those which have come through. And we are hoping we should be able to get more but having said that, we all know that even some of these people who are giving us funds have also been struck by the COVID. So we don't expect a lot of grants to come through from most of these countries because they also have to support their populations in terms of how do they kickstart their economies because everybody's having a recession. And then the last one is external loans. And there's a lot of debate on borrowing, government borrowing. So we can borrow either from multilateral institutions like the World Bank or the IMF, but we also borrow from bilateral institutions like the Exim Bank of China. So these are our sources of, of revenue. And they are going to continue to be the, the same sources of, of revenue. The only difference is the levels will vary. So how will they vary? And that will be somehow answering to how COVID has affected us. I say that most of our funding has been coming through domestic revenue. So what does this constitute of? There are a number of things. One, we have consumption taxes. This is VAT on imports. So when you import something, usually you pay some VAT at the point of entry. Now, we all know that with COVID, imports have declined. So which means that that, is, and that was a major source of consumption tax. So if you reduce imports, and we're talking about import, import substitution, it means that we're already having a big minus on, the, on that side. Then we had domestic VAT, where usually VAT is put on a number of things. When you conduct a workshop, you have a hotel, you do so many things, you, you pay VAT. And then we have excise duty, which is paid on, on things we consume, things we buy from the shops and so on. And we know that we don't want to raise a lot of this because if we do, we are going to be hurting most of our people which are the vulnerable groups. So that is not a very good option either. What are we left with? We are left with the direct taxes. What is under direct taxes? We have pay as you earn. We have corporate income tax. We have withholding tax. Now, already government is saying we are going to defer corporate income tax because the firms and the companies are crying. 
So you see already we have a problem there. There, as you add, we can't raise it much higher than it already is. Because even people who are working are not earning enough for us to raise the, the, the pay as you earn. And we also know that um, a number of people are even laid off as we speak. So it means that even pay as you earn has issues. So what else do we have in terms of taxes? We have trade taxes. And these include petroleum duty and when we have some import duties. So we, we know that with this lockdown, for example, a simple example, with the lockdown, we've reduced the consumption of fuel. That means that even that, already we are having a big minus in terms of what government can, can get. So what am I saying? Overall, COVID has had a very negative impact on domestic revenue mobilization. And this was our biggest source of funding for activities. I've said that we can't go into the second one a lot. We, we shall borrow a bit, but we can't do much because if we borrow a lot from the, the banks, we are squeezing the private sector. They can't access the same, the same loans. Grants, we have no guarantee that people are going to give us a lot of grants. They also have issues. So what are we left with? We're left with loans. So you see where our government is being pushed. And why are we being pushed to the loans? Because there are so many demands. When Sophie was talking, she talked about so many things. And then when Rebecca came in, she even added on to the, the list of things. This is a, a developing country. We already had our issues before even COVID came in. Now when COVID came in, it they made the situation worse, making us actually need even more things, need more recurrent costs, for example, for health, need to put more money in education as it becomes distance learning and so on. And then the question of course is, where is this money going to come from? You've seen that we can't squeeze the population because you don't have money to pay. We can't guarantee that we are going to get the grants. And even the borrowing has limits. We're not supposed to go beyond 50% of our GDP. So what, that, what does that mean? It means that even the budget, as you, you're reading, 45 trillion. Actually, in the end, it may, it may be less than that. So we're looking at that resource envelope actually may be coming down from 45 trillion for the next financial year because of the fact that most of our sources have issues. So having said that, then we are going to look at how we reallocate the reduced resource envelope. What do we prioritize? Because we have first of all to contain COVID, which means that we are going to look at those critical sectors that have been hit by COVID, for example, health, the, the health sector. And most of these are recurrent costs. And then we have to look at what are the effects of some of the other things that uh, Sophie talked about, the floods. The floods have caused havoc for a lot of infrastructure. And this has to be put up again, because much as we are, we are saying we are going to contain COVID, that's not the end of the world. We must continue to ensure that we have some growth in the sector. Otherwise, even the, the financial year coming after next financial year, there'll be nobody to, to tax if there's no cross. So you're looking at how do we even look at some of the so many roads, bridges we are washed away, some of these have to be put back. We're not even talking about putting up new bridges. We are saying putting back bridges which have been washed away, and there are very many in, in a number of places. We are looking at uh, the landslides. So there are a lot of things that uh, we, we are looking at in terms of what we have to do as government. And that challenge is balancing. Don't tell me it's balancing the board, balancing the budget. How do we balance the reducing resource envelope with the increasing demands? The demands are horrendous in terms of what is it that you can do? What can you leave out? Do you, do you say, let me look at these people who are hard, in the hard to reach areas and uh, see how I, I, I make them a community road or do I put some money in the, in the oil area such that we can have some oil refineries in a few years for us to be able to, to have income. These are the difficult questions that we are, we, are, we are having to answer. And I want to thank Rebecca and uh, Sophie for all the proposals. And I want to, 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 to actually ask you why that we've actually looked at most of the things you're saying, and we are trying to, to, to actually debate and see which is the best way forward. What do we take up this financial year? What do we, what do we leave? because we're even looking at some of the projects we had proposed next financial year, we are putting them on hold. We are rescheduling some of them because we think we cannot manage to, 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 to fund all the things that we wanted to, 
to be able to do. So those are going to be the trade-offs in terms of us, of course, like uh, Sarah, you were asking, we are, we, are, we are not putting money in travel, especially if you travel abroad. There may be a bit of travel inland, but not much. You're looking at things like workshops, removing some of that money, but of course, leave, reallocating maybe that money to digital conferencing, because that is also a recurrent cost. So we are trying to see how, what we can postpone. We, we have a list of projects that we've come up with, those which we think we can actually put on a hold, those which we think we can reschedule. It will be, of course, it depends whether they're already running, who is financing, if the projects are, are co-funded with the development partners, we not have a lot of choice because you have to continue because you already signed up agreements and this have to continue running. We have to look at some of these um, infrastructure projects where we have uh, running contracts. Those are legal obligations which we can defer and we have just to hang in there and ensure that we continue funding some of these things. So what are we going to do in terms of us ensuring that we have efficiency? This is going to be, this is something we are all talking about. That now, now that the envelope is reducing, the demands are expanding, really government, we have to get serious in terms of efficient and effective use of resources. We all know people are talking a lot about corruption and this is something people talk about every day. And some of us even in government talk about it. And this is a battle that most of us have been fighting. This is what we, some of us are paid to do. And it's been an uphill task in terms of how do we contain and ensure that the little money that we have does what it is supposed to do. So government is, is, is um, planning to step up our monitoring efforts and also our anti-corruption agencies are going to do a better job, I hope. But what has also happened, the Minister of Finance, as I speak, has set up what they are calling an economic response unit, ERU, and it's under the Minister of Finance to coordinate government responses for COVID-19 to mitigate socioeconomic impact of this uh, virus in the country. So this unit is, is taking all the, is setting up a, an operational structure to coordinate inputs, analyze all your proposals, support the creation of an effective decision making process to respond to the crisis effectively and efficiently. And we're hoping that this unit will be able to, to complement the efforts of all the other departments and units in government. So this unit has a, lot, a number of stakeholders. It's not a, a government unit. We have private sector on board. We have members from Manufacturing Africa, for example, three of them are on board already. And we are trying to see how we actually take this, this forward. I want to quickly give my recommendations because um, I'm running for another meeting myself in terms of uh, recommendations. Much as I work in government, I have four recommendations for, for my government. We must ensure effective use of the limited resources. So we, we have to improve our coordination efforts. We have to step up our anti-corruption efforts and ensure that we even disseminate information to the, to the general public. Because one of the, the biggest problems with us is poor communication. And you find that most of the people actually don't benefit from what we are saying or don't know how to access these things. We talked about uh, this Mioga fund or the liquidity fund, which is for the vulnerable people. So we must communicate this effectively for people to know what this fund is, how they can access it, to ensure that people actually can have a stimulus for their livelihoods. Number two, we have to ensure participation of all the relevant stakeholders because this is not a problem of government. This is for all of us government, private sector, civil society, and of course our de development partners. So we want to thank civil society. You're very active, you're really active in terms of participating in a number of, of our events. Please continue to participate in the policy debates and also participate in the implementation. I know that some of you have money. So please use that, some of that money to complement government in terms of some of the things we shall not be able to do because of limitations in our funding. For civil society, I'm recommending three things. Please step up your watchdog function. Ensure that we, you, you, you keep us on our toes. No on our doors, this is not going right. I think we should do, be doing A, B, C, D. Keep government on, 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 the, on their toes. And also please disseminate information widely to the public because this will improve public demand for accountability. Most of our people cannot demand for things because they don't know what is going on. And I think you can play a key role in terms of disseminating information about public 
programs, what we are planning to do, where we are planning to do these things, that will complement your watchdog functions. And I, again, I want to say that please use mobilize funds because at times you get more better money than us from some of those development partners. But if you do, please use some of that money to orient yourselves to contain the effects of COVID. I want to thank you. Yeah, Ma Margaret, thank you very much. But before you go off, I have two or three quick questions for you. One is our concern on the, on the debt burden. We have the current debt at 48.9 trillion and the debt GDP show is coming close to 50% as you have said. Mm. I know the challenges you have mentioned, but I would like to know in your view, do you think we have value for this money? Have we got value for this borrowed money and, and the debt burden that is on us as citizens and to the future generation? And related to that is the question on dormant loans, on non-performing loans. We know that uh, the, the bulk of these non-performing loans are in the Ministry of Energy and in the Ministry of Transport because of lack of counterpart funding to buy land where these projects are supposed to be. What are the measures to remedy these non-performing loans, especially considering that there are charges on undisbursed funds of 0.1% and then charges on disbursed funds of 0.7% question is related to the COVID supplementary budgets. The big chunk of this money has gone to defense and steel when mm -hmm. we have a health pandemic. And as a result, we have health workers who are the foreigners with no protection. Just, you know, lacking basics, we saw the incident in Kayunga quarantine center where patients are being sent home to collect mattresses. And that risks the lives of the other people in terms of contacts and then the costs of tracing contacts. What is it that makes finance a huge amounts of money, especially on security and defense, when we are faced with a health pandemic? Thank you, Sarah. I'll, I'll begin with the last one. What is it that makes finance put a lot of money under, the, under defense when we have a, 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 healthy, a health issue? I just say that uh, budgeting is a political process. And, and by the way, before you, you pin us who work in this Ministry of Finance, just maybe answer yourself the question, who is the Minister of Finance? The President. Look at the Constitution. Who is the, the Minister of Finance by the Constitution of the country? The President. And who is the Commander-in-Chief of the Forces? The President. So maybe some of these things are actually constitutional issues that have to be reviewed before we can actually be able, all of us, to meaningfully answer some of these questions. I will leave it at that. Now, Sarah, the issue of uh, the debt burden. Yes, I agree that uh, we've been borrowing a lot of money, and borrowing is not a bad thing if you use the money properly. Because a number of countries in the, in the Asian countries have been able to borrow and devolve. But I think one of our biggest challenges, as you know, is the issue of value for money. So I'm going to say that for some projects, we've had value for money. But for a number of projects, we don't have value for money. So if you want to know what are the issues, you can read some of our reports, budget monitoring reports. We usually list some of these things where we have a lot of wastage. And this is something we've been flagging, that we have a lot of wastage of public resources in a number of these projects. And that, of course, relates to the issue of uh, dormant loans. Um, the issue of uh, having way leaves or having land for infrastructure projects has been a big issue. And we've been debating this issue for the last two or three years, actually, in terms of what should be done to ensure that government does not get money before it gets land. Uh, and now we, we have a, a law, I think I can call it a regulation now, under finance, that anybody who has a project and you require land, we don't approve it if you don't have a land title. That is for starters now. So people who are going to have projects, whether it is going to be building a school or a hospital, if you don't flag your land title now, we don't approve. But for those who are already running, and these are very many, of course, like you look at um, the transmission lines, you have to get money for compensation. You're looking at the roads, you're looking at the railway, this needs uh, land. 
we government actually had talked of putting up a land fund under the Ministry of Lands, and you know, you know that most of these funds, once you begin putting them up, then it becomes a political issue. And there's been a lot of debate whether we should actually continue, whether, whether actually we should set up this fund. Because for us, we thought that if we have this fund and government just gets to know where they need land and they pay for it once and for all. But of course, we found that um, a number of institutions we are anti, meaning we're against this move for reasons that you can imagine in terms of them wanting to be able to be the ones to get the money to go and compensate the people who are on the land and so on. And I think they, this one actually go, takes us back to the issue that you, you raised, the issue of value for money and no value for money, and it all comes under one word, corruption. We all know that uh, corruption has, has become a household name or word in this country, and people think that corruption is a way of life. And I want to call upon you people in civil society, because some of us in government looks like we can't actually fight it from within. So help us, please, help us in terms of us, how do we actually fight corruption? Because if we don't, all the things we are talking about here, all the realigning of the budget, putting money from here to there, nothing much will happen. And we shall continue having most of the issues as we've had them for the last so many years. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Margaret. At this juncture, I want to invite Leah, if there are any questions in the, in the chat room. And for participants with quick questions, please put up your hand on the, put up your hand on the, on the, on the participants forum, and I'll be able to speak you to ask questions. Leah, can you go through the chats quickly? Uh, yes, um, since we've actually, we, we're already over time, uh, it, may, it may not be possible to have interventions, verbal interventions from the floor, but I'll quickly just, um, just read through um, some of the comments that have actually been shared. Uh, one is from Hazel, who says, uh, thank you, Margaret, for recognizing the fact that consumption tax, i.e. that, is not the way to go, uh, to go when it comes to alternative sources of revenue. Uh, I recently held a poll on Twitter uh, about what would be the alternative sources and 61% voted taxing the rich. I think that's very important, taxing the rich and corporations. 31% voted limiting tax exemptions, while 8% voted for consumption taxes. And government has also received money from companies and individuals in response to COVID-19, and none of this has been accounted for. Again, issues of accountability coming up. Um, I, I had actually written a, a comment um, in the section asking about the viability of the conversation on debt forgiveness, because we are saying that we have these contractual obligations and we have no choice but to pay. But the truth is, if we pay, we might actually die. So it would have been really interesting to hear how far, because I know that um, as a continent and a lot of um, southern states are banding together to advocate for debt forgiveness or at least debt restructuring and deferment. It'd be interesting to find out how far that has gone. Uh, a comment from Nivatiti from Action Aid saying the Ministry of Finance should prioritize funding to sectors that address GBV spikes and root causes of GBV adopting a holistic approach. Both preventive and response strategies should be prioritized by government and Ministry of Finance and realigned uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. A gender equity budgeting can go a long way in preventing and responding to GBV um, in Uganda. Uh, I think this was a, I don't know if Sophie saw this, a question uh, about whether CS Bag has any collaborations with local governments or community based organizations to get feedback uh, from the point of service delivery. I do know that Forward has something like that when it comes to their, I think they're called village budget teams. Um, maybe Rebecca um, can respond to that as well. All right. Um, I think um, um, the, the other comment is really around uh, someone agreeing with, um, uh, with the issue of of uh, that was raised around there not being any clear strategies for ensuring that transportation is actually inclusive um in in hard to reach areas and also the issue of border borders the fact that actually border borders have always 
uh, perform the function of reaching the last mile. And now without border borders, it means that taxis, you know, the public transportation that's available is still insufficient because you, you can only um, go so far and the challenges that might arise from that. Um, Oh yes, and someone also agreeing about issues emerging from the private, uh, rather from the informal sector, that they have actually not been adequately addressed. And, uh, and the last one, which has just come through that I'll read, um, uh, something about youth and women involved in informal businesses in border districts being in dire need because of restrictions um, uh, around COVID-19. As we are all aware, um, there is, uh, right now, there's no public transportation in, in the border districts because of the risks that are arising from the COVID-19. And is government going to prioritize supporting circles uh, in these places? So I can see that most of them were, were really comments. Maybe there may be a question or two for, for Margaret uh, before she jumps off. And I apologize that we're not able to bring in the audience as much as we would like to um, as a result of um, not having adequate... Thank you very yeah, thank you very much, Leah. I wish to invite, give two minutes to each of our panelists. They can conclude, they can comment on the questions or comments raised by participants in their concluding remarks. Two minutes each, starting with Sophie. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for the discussion. Um, I would like to talk about three issues. One is what Leah uh, was asking about uh, is there debt forgiveness. I will say there's been deferment, what, what I know at least that's come out. There's been deferment for most of our loans. We, many countries have allowed countries, especially developing countries, to uh, not pay their interest at the moment until after December 2020. So starting next year will be expected to pay. But that doesn't mean that you have, you might have, it might look like you have more money now, but you still have to pay that interest when the time comes. So it's something that you can think of, do I pay now or do I pay later? Uh, about the person who was inquiring about CSBAG having um, structures at the local government, yes, we do. We, first we have our partners that are based at the local government that work with us, our members. But also we have participatory budget clubs. These are in the districts where we operate, currently up to 26 districts. And there are structures that work as low as the village level that build cap that to build capacity for to act to understand budget issues and they uh, carry out accountability of uh, government financing at the local government. But we also have community-based facilitators. We have our members and many other structures that we use to provide, build capacity, and also collect information. Uh, there is something I wanted to clarify uh, that as the discussion was going on, I think it was from the, the person who came in, the, the panelist who came in after me, uh, about, I just wanted to clarify that increased financing doesn't mean specific, directly mean uh, a focus for government uh, interventions. There might be areas that have a lot of financing, but like I said earlier on, some of it is tied to projects and it's carried on over years. So it might not, it doesn't directly relate that this is the area that is being, fo being focused on. That's why it's good to look at the strategy and see what areas are being focused on in a particular financial year. I think that's uh, majorly it. Ma Margaret brought clarity for most of the areas in the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. Rebecca? Rebecca, are you still with us? Yes. Uh, sorry. I my, my, I've, I've unmuted, okay. I'll say that uh, my final word would be that most of the things that I'd actually talked about have been um, clarified. One was the Neoga, I didn't know about it, which was something good and other people should know about, especially those who are participating in this Zoom meeting. 
that there is that that can cater for the people who are in the informal sector. And also the GPV can only be addressed if we look at the causes of GPV. Yes, we can look at that, but at the same time, we also want to look at response. That's the side where it has already happened, what do we do with it? So I was calling upon both government still and us in the civil society to look at, at ways of how we can address gender-based violence. Thank you so much. I think that is all I have to say. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And lastly, Margaret. Yes, two words. Well, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for this very interesting meeting. I want to thank my fellow panelists for a very good discussion because you made my work easier in terms of having the information there for me just to make clarification and adding a few things. I want to call upon civil society, please continue. Continue lobbying, continue your watchdog function, and the struggle continues. Thank you. Thank you very much, our distinguished participants. That has been very informative. And for us as participants and the moderator here, we have learned a lot. And we hope that these dialogues will continue. Thank you a lot, Leah and, uh, and Maria, for the support for the convening of this workshop. And I wish to invite Leah to officially close this workshop. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you for capably um, steering this conversation. I will try to, to wrap up in exactly one minute because we're really over time. Um, these conversations are a, are a result of a partnership between Akina Mama Africa and Frederick Ebert Stifton. And this is because we realized that there was a gap in public policy conversations that involve a lot of what you'd call everyday people. A lot of these conversations are left to technocrats. And just like Margaret rightly said, if you do not have information, it is really, really difficult to challenge. You know, she shared some information here about um, um, the, the funding that is going to be available for the circles. And some people were saying that that is the first time they're hearing about it. So it's important um, that that information is available so that then people can hold um, the state accountable. From everything that has been shared, you know, it is quite clear that the stimulus package is, is, is critical to writing the economy uh, and leading to a resilient recovery uh, as, uh, because the econ economy has right now has been de decimated um, uh, by the pandemic. So a stimulus is critical to making sure that we get back to where we were before and even making sure that we are stronger. But it has to be something that is actually inclusive and accessible um, to everybody. Funding for social protection and social security has also been emphasized. Uh, conversations around debt at the national level, although we've not talked about debt at a personal level, but I think Rebecca mentioned it to some extent that actually a lot of people are now having to go to loan sharks because they have um, no access to funding. And that is a result uh, of some of the stimulus packet, first of all, coming really late up to now, it's not yet available. Uh, like I couldn't go to a bank now and find it. That is something that is still going to take a few weeks to put into place. And, and also emphasis on, on funding the health sector. This is a conversation that was present even before the pandemic, and the pandemic has shown us that that is um, something that we cannot do away with. And as we see, um, our numbers are increasing, which means that the current health sector as it is will quickly get overwhelmed. So I'd like to thank you all for staying on uh, till the end. And I'd like to invite you to continue joining us in these conversations. We have about three more webinars left and we hope that you'll be able to enjoy, uh, to join us um, at that point in time as well. At this point, I'd really just like to again, thank all the panelists for making the time to share with us uh, their knowledge and to also thank our co-conveners, FES Uganda, uh, for sub supporting us to actually um, convene um, this conversation. So thank you so much. Have a fantastic rest of the week. Please listen in on the budget speech tomorrow. And let's see if some of the issues that we actually discussed today uh, will emerge uh, as priorities for the government as well. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Yeah.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.